Welcome all of you to this live program at Authentic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Bashar Alolabi from Brantford, Canada. Dr. Alolabi is an orthopedic surgeon with interest in upper extremity surgery, sports medicine, joint arthroplasty, and post traumatic reconstruction. He's an assistant professor at McMaster University and currently practices at the Brantford General Hospital. He completed a shoulder and elbow fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic and was part of the team of consultants for the Cleveland Indians, Browns, and Cavaliers. Also completed a trauma and lower extremity arthroplasty fellowship at the University of Toronto Sunnybrook Health Science Center. He also obtained his master's of science degree in medical biophysics from the Western University. Dr. Alalabi has received several national international awards recognizing his research, including the prestigious North American Traveling Fellowship in 2015. He's also given numerous talks at national and international conferences and has contributed a large number of orthopedic publications and book chapters. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Bashar Alalabi from Brantford, Canada. Over to you, Bashar. Mitesh, thank you very much uh, both to you and Luai for uh, hosting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, so um, I'm de delighted to be here. So thanks again. Um, today, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, a novel technique that um, that I started using a few years ago and is just being um, in publication currently, actually, right now, um, which is the medial, um, sorry, the selective triceps on medial paralecranon uh, approach, uh, mainly used for elbow arthroplasty, but I'll also um, talk towards the end about how um, I feel elbow exposures. Um, this technique really came on, I, you know, I trained, I did my residency in uh, Western Ontario in London um, with Graham King, um, who's well known to the elbow world. And, um, you know, I learned from him, um, he, he was using the lateral paralecranon technique and I learned that from him. And, and as I started uh, getting into my practice, I, I, I found some difficulties with that approach and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that as uh, we go on. Um, and so um, I, me and um, another um, staff uh, from uh, Vancouver um, uh, basically came up with this approach and started using it. He, he had started using it before I did and then I modified it a little bit and we started using it. So. Um, uh, so I want to acknowledge, um, you know, my co-authors, uh, uh, Dr. Carlos Prada uh, and Dr. Khan from um, the, the fellows that helped us with this uh, paper. Um, so, uh, you know, as you all know, uh, the indications for total elbow arthroplasty have changed over the last uh, uh, number of years. So um, rheumatoid arthritis used to be the most common reason for any uh, elbow arthroplasty in the past. But as rheumatoid arthritis has become less of a problem um, uh, with medications, uh, we've, we've seen a significant decrease in the number of elbow arthroplasties done for rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, most common uh, right now would be uh, for fracture, um, and then probably secondary would be post-traumatic uh, arthritis, and uncommon to do elbow arthroplasty for, um, uh, for primary OA, but it is there as... Um, uh, as something that uh, can, can be used or, or when when indicated. Um, so if we look at a, uh, the best approach for elbow arthroplasty um, for a total elbow, uh, uh, sorry, for, to, to do an elbow arthroplasty, basically you want something that gives you adequate exposure um, so that you can put your implants in the proper position um, uh, we want a low risk for nerve damage. Uh, we want to be able to preserve the triceps function and allow uh, early rehab and motion of the elbow. And you know, the, the more you're able to, um, to allow early rehab, the better the patient outcomes and range of motion is. So if we look at the, the techniques that have been utilized in the past for this, so um, they're, they're generally divided into two main sections. So you have your triceps off uh, um, approaches, which basically means uh, the triceps is, in, is involved or taken down from either its ulnar insertion or cut at the fascia level at uh, some point during the surgery. Um, these usually require some form of triceps repair and you typically need to protect your triceps post-operatively. Um, 
And these approaches are usually split into three different categories. So you have the triceps turn down approaches or a tongue approach, for example, where you take part of the tendon down, then you split the muscle underneath it, and then you repair the, the tendon back to, um, to itself um, later on. So then you have the tricep splitting approach where you go midline and then reflect the triceps off of the olecranon on both sides. And then the triceps reflection approaches where you lift up the tendon medial to laterally or laterally to medially, or there's a modification, which is the, an the ankeneous triceps lateral flap approach. So generally those are the three categories of triceps off approaches. Um, and th this is an example of the um, tricep splitting and then um, reflecting that tendon from one side to the other. The, the main advantage of triceps appro off approaches is it gives you such a great exposure with your ulna. It's very easy to look at your ulna, it's easy to, to work on it, and then um, hence your components are more likely to be in the right place if you have good exposure. The obvious disadvantage is the, the, the damage to the triceps tendon. So that um, has been shown to lead to triceps failures or a higher risk of triceps failures, weakens the triceps muscle, and you also need to protect the, the patient's triceps postoperatively, which may lead to um, less than ideal range of motion or function later on because of the immobilization. Triceps on approaches are essentially uh, approaches that preserve the triceps uh, tendon or the majority of the triceps tendon insertion on the ulna. Um, and, um, uh, and the main, you know, the, the three typical um, approaches that have been described in the past, there's more than these, but these are the typical ones, are the paratricipital, where you're just going from both sides of the triceps, uh, Alonzo Lamis approach, uh, which is a modification of this, and then the uh, lateral paralecranon technique, which uh, was described by Graham King, um, and that was my early experience, where you basically go right, it's a Boyd approach on the ulna, so you go right lateral to the ulna, um, as you can see here from the, from the picture, and then um, you end up splitting the triceps uh, fascia and muscle beyond the insertion. So, um, so it was uh, mainly a, a an advantage of the paralecranon technique was to give a little better exposure to your, uh, to your ulna, yet preserve the insertion of the triceps so that it's a triceps on approach. The, obviously, the main advantages of this is it maintains your triceps function, it allows early rehab, but sometimes this comes at the, at the disadvantage of a difficult exposure to your ulna, potentially worrying about putting your components in the wrong uh, place or not or a little off, um, which could lead to er earlier loosening of the implants, specifically the ulnar implant. Um, and again, uh, due to some of these techniques, th there is a little higher risk of the ulnar nerve uh, uh, being put into traction or uh, endangering it during the procedure um, as a result of trying to work around your triceps uh, and get the best exposure you can. I'll, I'm going to show a video of Graham King's uh, lateral paralecranon technique. And, um, and, and show you how, um, how there's some difficulty um, or concern with this technique. And this is where I started uh, trying to look for other uh, approaches. So let's hope this works. Give me one sec here. So you can see as he's trying to prepare the ulna, um, uh, you basically need to posteriorly dislocate the, the humerus on the, the uh, coronoid on the, um, on the humerus in order to get exposure to the um, uh, to the greater sigmoid notch. And you can see he's this, so the ulnar nerve is actually right there. He's trying to put, push it to the side. Um, and the only way you can really uh, put this, the bell saw reamer, which is what the, this system uses uh, from uh, striker latitude, is to really dislocate the humerus posteriorly or the, uh, the, uh, the coronoid posteriorly to try to, to decrease the risk on the ulnar nerve. Um, I, you know, and even uh, during his video, he says, you know, in stiff elbows, this can become very difficult. Uh, and you can see this big bell saw reamer um, is very close to the nerve. And, you know, when I, I did this technique for a number of years um, after my training, um, and, you know, it's doable, but I, every time I would do the case, I always had this really bad feeling in my stomach about the ulnar nerve because it just seemed that it was too close to where the bell saw is coming in. 
And uh, it was always very sort of nerve wracking and I would be sweating, just making sure that the ulnar nerve is out of place so that it's not, a, uh, it's not at risk for injury during the approach. So, um, so hence uh, sort of trying to come up with a different, uh, and you know, it was at this time when I met Dr. Uh, Tom uh, Getz in uh, Vancouver, and he had been starting to use what he called the uh, the medial paralecrinon, which is instead of going on the lateral side of the of the ulna, you're going on the medial side, and I'll I'll describe the approach in a second. And I found that was so much better in terms of exposure and also uh, much less risk for the ulnar nerve. And so we worked on it together and modified it a little bit. Uh, I added a, a couple more modifications personally that I do. And then um, we, as I said, we uh, just are publishing our first case and we'll go over some of the results of that. So in general, when you look at uh, triceps on versus triceps off approaches, um, the triceps off approaches have about a 15% risk of triceps failure and a 40 to 50% loss of tricep strength when you look at the literature. Um, the triceps on approaches typically have close to zero or zero percent triceps failure, but again, the potential component malpositioning has been has been raised up. So this is the stomp approach, or again, we, we call it the medial paralecranon approach, or the selective triceps on medial paralecranon approach. So I'm going to show a number of pictures essentially here to go over the technique. So this is how I position all my patients. They're supine with a sterile tourniquet. Um, this is the arm pointing upwards right now. Um, you can see my incision. I curve my incision uh, either slightly laterally or medially away from the olecranon tip just to decrease the point loading on the olecranon tip with a scar. After the incision is done, so you can see I've started to, um, to open up the ulnar nerve and expose the ulnar nerve and unroof it, but I only really get just to the cubital uh, tunnel. I, you know, you can and you'll see a modification. Um, when I started doing this approach, I actually would, would only do this much ulnar nerve work. I would actually not do any further. I would not uh, encirculate the ulnar nerve. I would not. Uh, I would just unroof it right to the cubital tunnel and then stop it at there, exactly like what this picture shows. Um, and, and you'll see uh, Dr. Getz had uh, actually does uh, release the nerve a little more, and it does make the exposure a little easier, um, and we'll go over that in a second. But um, after basically dealing with the ulnar nerve, you can see here uh, this dotted line. Um, basically, so this is your, um, so the, the hand is distally, the shoulder is proximal. You can see the tourniquet there. The, this is the medial border of the, of the ulna. So you can see I've drawn a line essentially right on the medial border of the ulna. I leave a very small uh, fascia from the um, uh, flexor carpi ulnaris um, just to repair to. And then if you continue this line, down, you basically end up right at the medial border of the triceps tendon. So you basically just take, you know, uh, one quarter or even sometimes less, so it's essentially a sliver of the um, medial triceps tendon, uh, just so that you have a tendon to repair back to um, when, when, you, when we close and you'll see. So essentially at most, this, is, this ends up being about a quarter of the triceps tendon um, uh, insertion, um, oftentimes even less. So again, here's a, a graphic showing the exposure. So on the medial side, the medial border of the ulna going into just a, a little bit of a, trice, a medial triceps tendon. On the, um, and, you, and again, you can release a, 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 the ulnar nerve and it will make your exposure a lot easier and faster if you do that. Then on the lateral side, essentially we're doing a coker approach. So we're going between ankyneus and ECU. And then that just goes on into the lateral, um, uh, the, the lateral border of the triceps muscle um, on the column. And again, we'll show some pictures of that. Again, here's an example of uh, um, working with the nerve and, and releasing the nerve uh, to start. Um, uh, just enough so that you're, you, you get it around the epicondyle. You do not need to go anything beyond that. You do just right up till you see the first branch uh, to the FCU. Um, and that's it. That's pretty much all the ulnar nerve work or, 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 um, or retraction you need to do in the whole case. And again, you, you know, and again, here is an example where you don't even have to do that. You can just go right to the cubital tunnel and stop there, but it will make the next steps a little more tricky. So next, you can see here, I'm starting to open up the FCU fascia. So again, just leaving a very small cuff of tissue. Um, hopefully this next picture will come soon. Here we go. Um, you can see uh, just the, the FCU fascia 
uh, being um, being uh, sort of split here, right, leaving a small cup of tissue on the ulna, and then basically that carries on right to that um, you know twenty five percent or less of the triceps um, um, tendon. Bring that marker. Yeah, there we go. Again, so here again, only about uh, twenty five percent or less uh, of the triceps uh, tendon medially, um, um, and you can see. You, basically just starting to split that now and then you're splitting the muscle underneath it just putting in a gelpi um now just to try to open up that uh that area and again be essentially now releasing that tendon and the muscle off of the medial border of the ulna so that you know a small sliver of triceps tendon just taking it off the olecranon um, all the way on, um, reaching your your EC, your FCU um, uh, small fascial uh, split that we talked about. So um, if you if you've left the ulnar nerve in its groove, then here you just have to be very cautious so that you lift up everything with the ulnar nerve. So you lift off the the tissue underneath the ulnar nerve from the groove. If you've already taken the the the, the ulnar nerve out of the groove, which is how I showed it earlier on, then really you just you can just do this with the cautery. You just basically take uh, the cautery and literally release everything right off the epicondyle. You have nothing to worry about because your ulnar nerve um, is around the groove at this point. Again, releasing everything here. Um, there's a fat pad under, uh, um, underneath the, the tendon right over the olecranon fossa. And you can see here, the pictures are just lagging behind a little bit. So you can see here the fat pad being excised. And then next you'll you'll start seeing. So here you can see how um, this is the medial border of the of the olecranon, the, the, the triceps, uh, that small sliver of the triceps and FCU have started uh, being lifted off. So essentially what we're doing is we're lifting the whole FCU off of the ulna, ulnar border. I, again, I've left a small cuff of tissue to repair back to. But essentially, you're literally taking the whole FCU off of the ulna. And what that does is it actually lifts both the FCU and your um, ulnar nerve together. What's, what, what you're doing here is you're, um, we're, we're able to lift off the whole FCU with the ulnar nerve um, as one unit together off of bone. And so you don't have to worry about the branches of the, of the ulnar nerve to the FCU anymore because they're coming off with the nerve and that whole sleeve of tissue is coming off of the ulna. There we go. Yes, Bashar. Yes, we're gonna keep going. Yes. There we go. Okay. Um, the presentation is just lagging behind a little bit for some reason. I... It's lagging. I know. Here we go. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's coming. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so essentially, that um, that's that's on the medial side. And you, this FCU split can be taken down essentially literally as far as you want down the ulna. And the more distally you go, the more that whole uh, soft tissue sleeve can come medially and the nerve is, uh, moves out of the way completely. And you can, um, you can take the MCL off of the, um, the sublime tubercle or leave it. Um, uh, if you're doing a linked prosthesis, there's not much, uh, you don't need to worry that too much about it. And um, and literally, you're, um, you can even take uh, as much of the brachialis off the coronoid tip as it becomes more, more apparent. So here you can see I have this whole FCU um, sleeve of tissue now. I've, I've just reapproximated it. But you can see essentially this whole sleeve with the nerve. The nerve is right inside it. So you're moving the whole sleeve of tissue with the, with the nerve together away from any harm. Um, this is just the same thing, just demonstrating that again. And you can see as we move here further, all of a sudden now you can actually start to see how you, you just by um, supinating, um, 
the the arm essentially your um your um uh you can start seeing the ulna the, the ulna dislocate essentially now and we haven't even done anything on the lateral side yet and you can see pretty much you're seeing a, a face-on view of the um uh, 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 greater sigmoid notch and the whole ulna right now. And you can see here, the, the nerve is completely away now. The, knee, the nerve with the FCU sheath are completely off and away from, from your exposure. So again, this is a cartoon of, of, of what you'll see there. Um, there's the, the uh, FCU with the, with the nerve together, completely off away. And you can, just by um, supinating the arm, you can see the um, the the uh, the ulna and the greater sigmoid notch, um, even without uh, going to the lateral side. So next, we're going to work on the lateral side. So essentially, this is a, a typical um, uh, lateral uh, border of the um, of the triceps. It's almost like a lateral paratricipital uh, on the ul on the humerus, uh, and then a cocor approach on the ulna. Uh, sorry, uh, a, a cocor approach. I meant more distally. Um, and you can see here's here's the exposure. So this is a pretty common exposure we all get. You basically go right to the radial neck and stop there, um, and then you're reflecting everything off of the lateral border of the uh, humerus. And I, I like to leave the ankyneus on. Uh, so the reason why we do this with a with a coker approach essentially um, is leaving the ankyneus on, um, so it provides a little more blood supply to the um, to the um, uh, uh, to the humerus and not uh, and the um, and the ulna, and you're not uh, um, you're not skeletonizing the ulna specifically. And again, here's a cartoon um, uh, showing that same exposure, leaving the the ankyneus on the attachment of the ulna to um, offer some uh, blood supply. Now, once you've done this, you can literally dislocate the elbow. So usually, the, we dislocate the elbow between the FCU and ulnar nerve and uh, and the, the and the triceps. So you can see basically your whole humerus now comes out. You can see the ulnar nerve um, completely um, in the FCU sheath. Uh, there's no tension on it whatsoever. Um, and um, you're between the triceps tendon over here and your ulna on the other side. And then what, here you can put in this, the, this pool to, to size your, 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 your humerus and, and uh, humeral component. Um, again, here's on the lateral side. I usually check the size of the spool by putting it into the greater sigmoid notch and then seeing um, it uh, centered on the radial head. And once I know it's centered on the radial head, um, then I know that uh, this is the right size. Um, you can start preparing either of the two. I actually usually prepare the ulna first, but um, this is an example where the humerus was prepared first. Um, and you know this basically is, is common. This depends on the system you're using. Um, but essentially typical standard preparation of the humerus, um, putting on the cutting guide. This is from the striker latitude system that I was using here. So, um, which is usually my preference of uh, implants, but, uh, um, but it doesn't matter. You, with, regardless of what uh, implant you're using, it's a, the, the approach um, uh, can be used. So once we, we finish the, the humerus, you can start to see now we're gonna work on the ulna and you can, you can see the, the ulna face on and I'll see as you as you supinate more, you basically have an excellent view of your ulna. Um, now we're putting the spool on. Uh, this is to to make the bell saw cut for the ulna. And again, you can see I have now this retractor um, hiding the FCU and and ulna. But literally, I mean, the more distally you go with the approach, this whole tissue is under no tension whatsoever, and your ulnar nerve is not even close to being at danger. You can see the bell saw here now going in. And again, here's another view, not, not as clear, but you can see the ulnar nerve sort of isolated with the penrose right over here now. Um, and you know you, you have an excellent view of your humerus with the bell saw reamer um, with no concern on the nerve whatsoever. And because it's on the medial side, your exposure of the ulna is excellent. The lateral paralecranon, you always have your radial head in, your, in, in front of you. And so your exposure to the ulna is always um, hidden by your 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 radial head to some extent. Even if you excise it, you're still working from the lateral side. Whereas here, you're working right on the medial side of the ulna, and so your exposure of the ulna is uh, is 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 exceptional, really. And here here's a cartoon showing this. This is the sliver of the 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 bone that comes off with the bell saw. 
And again, here's here's a picture again, a little fuzzy, but you can see you can see now what we've put in this um, this vault of guide wire into your your ulnar canal. You can you literally look at the ulnar. You're you're almost looking at it face on, um, just with the hypersupination of the arm. So the, the exposure to the ulna is excellent, and so. Uh, all the 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 downsides of the of the triceps on approaches where the ulnar exposure is not great and you're worried about uh, component malpositioning is gone here and you have an excellent view of your ulna and uh, you can put your implants where you really uh, where they really belong. Here's some preparation of the ulna and you can again see I'll show you here the triceps tendon essentially has not been violated except for the small very very small sliver that we took off which really contributes uh, nothing to the to the to the triceps. Here's some of the trial implants going in and then the implants reduced. And again, here, here's a, here's a picture of your, um, of your triceps tendon. It's just uh, coming up on the screen in a second. Um, here's a picture of your triceps tendon uh, insertion, uh, literally not, essentially not being violated um, uh, whatsoever with this insertion. So there's really no concern for triceps uh, insufficiency or weakness or failure um, with this. And again, you move on to putting in your real implants. Um, and here's uh, some pictures of that. Now, as we get the, um, as you start to close it, essentially now you just bring this whole sleeve back with the nerve or without the nerve, depending on whether you've released the nerve completely. But this whole sheath of tissue with the FCU and the small sliver of the triceps essentially goes back right to its origin or the small cuff that you've left it uh, on the ulna. Um, and you can see here, I'm closing this uh, the, the triangle or the, the corner where the triceps uh, small sliver came off um, right back to the triceps tendon um, with the FCU. And the nerve again is coming along with it if you've left it in its bed. Um, or if you've been circulated it earlier um, in the exposure, then um, you can uh, you can work with that or either transpose it or not. Um, you can see here as the the sheath comes back, it closes your your um, your approach completely so that the the nerve is sorry sorry that the implant is not exposed whatsoever. Um, the nice thing about this um, is. Uh, if you tag this with some uh, non-absorbable sutures, when you go back for any revision, you literally just go through the, the sutures and everything with the ulnar nerve comes off together. So your ulnar nerve is not even at risk for, for revision surgeries. Um, uh, specifically, if you've, um, if you've been circulated earlier and transpose it, then again, you just go through this, um, um, through this uh, interval with, with your, um, uh, your non-absorbable sutures. Um, and uh, again, you're at no risk whatsoever um, uh, for revision surgery. You don't even have to go looking for the nerve except for approximately just uh, seeing the nerve and, and then all of a sudden um, your whole approach is at no risk for the ulnar nerve in, in the revision setting. So it's a very good approach for revisions uh, without having to spend an hour or so just looking for your ulnar nerve and dissecting it off from scar tissue. So I'm going to go so over just uh, um, for the sake of time, just over some of our results um, uh, from the two institutions, uh, Dr. Tom Getz and mine, um, combined cases. So over, um, I've been using this approach probably for about uh, six to six years now. Dr. Getz has been essentially using uh, some form of it for about uh, over 10 years. So from 2010 to 2022, we had about uh, 30, um, sorry, that should say 38 arthroplasties and 36 patients, not the opposite. 78% um, of them were females, 95% uh, of them were total elbow arthroplasties, 5% hemiarthroplasties, and 87 were primary cases and the rest were revision cases. The indication um, was um, rheumatoid arthritis for about 50%. Um, fracture for about a, um, a quarter and uh, um, a secondary post-traumatic OA for a quarter and uh, only about 3% to revision. When we looked at the complication rate, uh, overall, um, there was a 10% complication rate, which essentially meant four patients and an 8% reoperation rate. 
Uh, two of the complications, so uh, essentially five, you know, 50 percent of the of the 10 percent of complications were related to elbow stiffness. Uh, one had uh, a lot of HO and had elbow stiffness, um, and the other um, had just uh, um, stiffness related to um, probably immobility and whatnot earlier in scar tissue. One of them required surgical treatment to, for stiffness um, and regained their motion, and the other was satisfied with the amount of motion they have and did not require any surgery. Um, and really there's only two, two major um, uh, complications. One patient had an ulnar, held ulnar nerve symptoms, again, related to HO formation. So immediately post-op, they did not have uh, ulnar nerve symptoms, but over the first uh, few weeks, they started developing some ulnar nerve symptoms and then they had HO that encapsulated their ulnar nerve. They mostly had sensory with uh, slight motor deficits. And um, but the, the the symptoms were not bad enough, and they actually did not require any further treatment. And one patient had a paraprosthetic fracture uh, with an olecranon fracture as a result of a fall um, in an, a rheumatoid arthritis patient and broke off uh, part of her olecranon um, uh, and the triceps. Um, but uh, other than those, really, the, the there there really were um, um, no no complications. You know, even nerve paresis, I think this is the biggest difference. I, I almost always had some, you know, in the majority of my patients had some nerve, uh, ulnar nerve paresis earlier on in my lateral paralecranon or other techniques that I've used. Since I've gone to this approach, um, you know, essentially, you know, when we looked at the patients and asked them, this is the only patient that even had some transient ulnar nerve symptoms. So, um, you know, some of this was um, coming from a uh, uh, chart review, so they might have not been documented, but um, uh, but essentially there's really, there were essentially no um, um, documented uh, transient ulnar nerve symptoms. Um, the presentation is coming back on, um, but I'll keep going for now. Uh, and again, we saw no uh, all, uh, triceps related complications whatsoever. Um, so overall, uh, the stop approach is an excellent approach for the for total elbow arthroplasty. Um, it spares the triceps tendon and function, lowers for the ulnar nerve, and excellent uh, subjective visualization of the ulna. Um, we're we're doing a study, or we're continuing the study now by looking at the the implant position to make sure that they have not been affected, uh, um, or that the the, the position is, is also um, good uh, with with CTs postoperatively. Here's an example of, uh, of sort of what you could get uh, for a coronoid fixation. Essentially, you can see the only difference with this approach is that the, you, you have to maintain the MCL intact and you can't take it off. But essentially, you get uh, by far the best visualization of, the cor of a coronoid fracture of any other approach that I've ever used. So I've, I frequently will use this in trauma cases uh, for exposures on the medial side. Um, uh, is this, uh, there's an opportunity for people to ask questions or is this no, yeah. or, or you guys, if you have any questions, you or yes, Lai? Bashar. Yeah, thank you, Bashar. Uh, presentation was awesome. I mean, it's a new approach. Uh, people are just coming to know about it. So uh, a few questions, uh, Bashar, do you think there is a risk for humeral component malposition uh, when you do this? Because you're, it's a triceps on approach, isn't it? Bashar, actually you can stop sharing. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, actually, I'm just going to show you one picture here to answer your question. If you look, hopefully this will come up. So, if you look at the at the humerus, here's a here's a picture of your humerus when with this approach. So. Um, the triceps on if does not affect your humeral visualization whatsoever because your your humerus is is coming out in between your triceps and and your FCU ulnar nerve complex. So the visualization of the humerus is is excellent, and you can you know use your epicondyles uh, or you can use the flat back of the of the humerus and uh, internally rotate fifteen degrees for your implant. Um, so I mean there I can't think of any better visualization of your humerus. To uh, to assess your your implant uh, position of the humor. So no, I, I honestly do not think that th that this has any effect on your humoral um, uh, uh, implant positioning. Adi, what about the ulna component? A again, you know, 
And with any with any uh, triceps on approach, you you have a little less visualization compared to ICEP, uh, triceps off approaches. So there's no doubt about that. But again, I, I showed you how well you know you literally you can you're almost looking at the ulna uh, right down, and you can see the flat back of the ulna. You can see your implant rotation. Um, and so honestly, I've not uh, I, I can't personally in my experience. There's no difference between how well I visualize the ulna. And from a component perspective with the triceps on, uh, oh, sorry, with this technique versus a triceps off, because I have full visualization of the ulna. Um, and um, I don't think really that there's much of a risk of ulnar position mal malpositioning in this technique versus other techniques of triceps on. Thank you, Bashar. We also joined by uh, Dr. Loy al Khatib, who's an orthopedic surgeon uh, based in uh, Dubai. Uh, Loy, your questions to Bashar, please. Sure, sure. Thanks, Basha. Thanks, Basha, for the brilliant uh, talk and presentation. One, one or two questions, maybe. Do you think yeah, this is, ahead. or do you believe in, in this statement, one size fits all, that this approach, stump approach, would uh, be usable or feasible for trauma cases as well as elective cases in cases of a hemiarthroplasty or total elbow arthroplasty, or would you go and do the olecron osteotomy in such cases? Yeah, so so I honestly use this approach for uh, any anything. Uh, so basically, all my arthroplasties, so hemiarthroplasty, total uh, elbow arthroplasty, I use the first, this approach. I know hemis have been uh, sorry, olecranon osteotomy have been used uh, heavily in uh, hemiarthroplasties, but um, uh, but I honestly I, I I've used this approach for all my hemiarthroplasties in the past, and I've done a good number of hemiarthroplasties. Um, I have not found that. Um, I needed the electron osteotomy. You know, with a lot of hemis, you're off. It's often a trauma case that you're starting off with, and, and you're and you're dealing with a trauma. So the only times I'll do a hemi, uh, an electron osteotomy for a, for a trauma for a hemi is if I've already done it for uh, an RIF, and then you, I can't fix it for some reason, and then I move on to doing a hemi. Then I've already done the electron osteotomy in that case. But I'm very um, if if I think I'm going to do a hemi or or a total elbow. Uh, in a trauma case, I'm very resistant to doing an electron osteotomy, and I'll try other approaches. Um, and this this will typically be my approach of of choice um, for if I'm going to convert to a to a hemi or a, or a total elbow. And again, you saw I, I use almost the same approach if I'm if I'm uh, approaching the coronoid from the medial side because of the visualization of the coronoid. So not from a, for a distal humerus fracture, but for for coronoid fractures. Then I'm 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 also using this approach for uh, for uh, coronoid fixations as long as it involves or needs a medial approach. Nice. So regarding the ulna now, I saw that you released it 360 degrees, 360 degrees all the way around. But how far you go proximal? And when you say when can can you say that's enough? I will not uh, dissect more for the ulna. Nerve. What would uh, what would be your target for the ulnar nerve mobilization? Would you, when would you say that this is mobilization is enough for my approach? Yeah. So basically, uh, so again, this is a little bit of the difference. So Tom gets that that described the, that started with the approach. He encirculates the nerve, and so he would he would circulate the nerve 360 to the groove, and right until he sees the the first uh, the first. Uh, uh, branch Lunch. of the FCU yeah. distally and proximally, just enough to be able to, to move the nerve anteriorly uh, around the medial epicondyle. And he does transpose the nerve anteriorly um, at the end of the procedure, because then in a revision, revision setting, it's a lot easier to, to, to not worry about it. So, um, so, you know, essentially he does enough of a release just to get the nerve around the epicondyle and transpose it later on, and then never touches it again later in the case because it just comes with the whole FCU sheath. Uh, when I, the, the modification I did when I started this approach was I left the ulnar nerve uh, without encirculating. I just unroof it until the Osborne's ligament, but without encirculating it, and then take everything off. It is a lot. It is a little more. Uh, you do have to be a lot more cautious as you're taking off the nerve with the FCU off of the epicondyle groove, um, uh, um, just because it's very close to the groove, and you just have to be a little more cautious there. So the approach is a little slower when you do it that way. But again, I'm not touching the nerve whatsoever. Pretty much the whole approach. Um, if you do release it just enough to move it anteriorly, then it makes the approach easier, but then you, you have to encirculate the ulnar nerve to some extent. But again, once you're done that first, that initial exposure there, you're, you're not really doing anything anymore to the nerve. You know, you're not retracting it for, 
for your components. You're not retracting it during the ulnar nerve. Oh, sorry, during the um, the preparation of the of the ulnar um, component. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of it is that you're yeah. um, and and you just look it through the lateral approach through the lateral window. You literally can, can you can dislocate yeah. either or. So typically, yeah. most of the dislocation happens between the nerve and the triceps tendon. Mm -hmm. um, so medially, essentially, but you can also dislocate it laterally. So you have that flexibility of going back and forth. Nice. Any more questions, uh, Lloyd? I think that's it. Do you have more? Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you, Bashar. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you Perfect. for this amazing presentation. And we, we really I, I, I apologize for the network. Uh, the hospital network, for some reason, is unstable today. So I apologize for all the... Uh, lagging and some of the uh, presentation issues here. No worries. Thank no you worries. so much. Thanks, Masha. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.